and the people known as Lord of the House in the Bible as well. Or, or, so it's equivalent like to Lord, Master, person of a higher disposition. And then the Saviour is given to a title to those who come to their communities to bring them back to worshipping God. So for example, in Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 27 or in Judges 2, 9, there are other saviours. So Lord and Saviour, according to what Christ would have been, would have been one by, sent by God who is your Lord, meaning your Master, to whom you have to follow, and Saviour, He's saving your community. That's all it means. It literally, it doesn't mean any divine title, because if you look at the Shema from Deuteronomy 6, 4, Pardon? It's the Christ. Pardon? It's the Christ, the Messiah. Yeah, we accept that as well, meaning the Masi, the, the anointed one, the one who came to bring the Jews back to worshipping God and God alone, the one foretold as the Messiah. But he's not God because the anoint, the anointee is not the anointed. So he was anointed, so hence he can't be God. So just to reiterate that point, you quoted earlier on as well from John 14, 6, when you said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man come through the Father but except through me. So again, this is a common misuse, understand by our Christian friends. All you've got to read is the context from John chapter 14, verse 1, where he says, on to, for, uh, in my father's house, there are many mansions. And then what he's saying to you, that there are many ways to get to God through particular ways. And in this occasion, he is the way, meaning Christ is the way to follow, for he's the life, follow my life, I speak the truth. No, I understand it. Do you understand? It's, so it doesn't carry any divinity. Get right before God. If you want to, when you die, if you want to be of the Lord, you have to follow me. You have to listen to what I say. You have to. And then coming back to. And that makes sense. That makes sense yeah. for me as a Muslim as well. Do you know why? Think about what I'm trying to say to you. In the in the time of era, the time he's living in, he's been sent specifically for the Jews, who had essentially become people who had transgressed. So he had to. He's got to bring them back to worshiping God and God alone. But they were expecting like a a king, um, Davidic Messiah, who would free them from the bondage of the Jews. Yeah, they didn't expect the, the Jews is that kept, they didn't expect they that. They didn't expect Messiah. that, yeah, yeah, they expected. So what yes. happened when they, they, they left somewhat bewildered and disappointed that he wouldn't like um, start an armed rebellion against them. So because that didn't happen, they were somewhat against him just for that very initial reason. And for the other reason that he was exposing the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and the Sadducees outside the religious temples. But what I want you to singularly focus on is the nuances of the words that were used. So when you use Lord and Saviour, in the back of your mind, you're, you're thinking to yourself, he must be God because he's Lord and he's a Saviour and only God saves. Hence, But that's not how you should think. Rather, in the language of the time, as I've already explained, a Lord is one of a highly elevated individual. Okay, And if you notice carefully here, check this out. When Paul breaks up the Shema from Deuteronomy 6.4, where for unto us there is one God, the Father in 1 Corinthians 8 6 and for unto us is one Lord Jesus Christ so even he distinguishes as to who God is who is the Father and who the Lord is who is Jesus Christ the one who is exalted to to God meaning because God loves him so much God God is the one who gives him the title of Lord it says in Romans that God gives him the title of Lord and but God there's, there's, there's so a scripture that uh, comes to mind it's in Isaiah yeah and it talks, it's like the Lord is, is fed, looking down and is fed up of what he's saying, our sin and so on. And he's asking who will go for us. And because, because no one is worthy to do so, in a sense he has to come himself. Who has to come? Well, the Lord has to come. But remember, our body is just a shell, okay? Our spirits is what lives on. So if God was able to his spirit to dwell in a man and to walk the earth and to show man the way then you know in order for that to be accepted, but that's you know you know what that's just a literal mean that God's actions speak through Jesus it's not that physically God dwells within Jesus because I think it's mentioned to Ephesians that the, the, the spirit of God dwells in the Christians as well yeah. Now that doesn't mean literally God is inside the Christians and hence they are God as well. Are you following me? It's just like a guidance. It's not God is going to come upon to you. It's God's no, it's going to... And, yeah, exactly. Basically, his, 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 his spirit in the sense of his guidance or his help. Or his, that's it. That's fine. We've got no issue with that. But see, you've got to be aware that you're not being flummoxed by terminology, which you then later seek to construe 
to meaning that Jesus must be God in some capacity because all of these titles that you're giving him. Yeah, but why does Jesus still receive worship? Like he doesn't stop. If you were to worship him now, he wouldn't stop from doing that. I mean, you know, compared to other prophets and someone that will say, no, I'm not. The Lord, he still accepts it. So meaning... I don't see where he accepts it anywhere. Because you know, like in 1 Chronicles, chapter 29, verses 20 to 23, it makes mention that David and the congregation are also given worship. To the Lord, yeah, to God. Yeah, no, to David. The, oh, to David. They give they give worship to God and to the con I can show it to you if you like like me to if you like me to see it. So they're giving worship to David as well. So now we've got to get familiar as a king. As a king, yes. So what we gotta understand you, but they're still worshipping him. Now what you gotta un well, remember when um uh okay, Holy Spirit, please bring it back to me. But you know when they are Going into Jerusalem, this is before Jesus was going to, 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 to die, and uh, everyone is celebrating. They've got palm branches and waving Messiah and so on. And then um, <coughs> the Sadducees and the Pharisees are very angry, and who is this? Blah blah blah. And Jesus basically said, You know what? The stones will cry out and worship me as well. So, you know, you can try and stop all your life, but the stones will cry out as well. To worship him? I don't see that anywhere in the Bible. Not, I don't I'm not really. Yeah, please have a, have a look for it, yeah. So when we look at the word worship, there's two words, there's two Greek words. One is called latrio, which is cultic worship, which is only offered to God the Father, yeah. meaning ritualistic worship. And the other word is called proskeneo. Proskeneo means paying homage. So in those days, if, if you, you know, if you went to see a guest, so rather bigger part, if a guest came to your home, yeah. you know how you would greet the guest? Yeah. You would bow or prostrate to him. Yeah as a form of welcoming. Sorry, find your, relax, yeah, find, your, find your verse as well. So, the term pros prosecuneo yeah. means paying homage or reverence or obeisance yeah. to someone of a high volition. Yeah. But it doesn't mean necessarily worship in the cultic sense. That's a word called latrio. Latrio is only to God alone. You understand? Like doing certain acts of ritualistic worship. Yes, yeah, so I'll explain to you slowly. Yeah. So there are two Greek words for there are two words for worship in the Bible. One is called latrio, which means cultic worship, which is ritualistic worship, which is only offered to God the Father. Then there's the other worship, which is re referred to as paying homage or respect or obeisance to someone. So just like I'll give you an example in one Chronicles 29:20, where the congregation they worship David as well and Solomon as well. So. That what we, so what we see, that's a form of showing obeisance. So the word there could very well be used as marking as homage. You understand? Some Bibles have it, re, have it refer, referenced as homage or paying due reverence. So that then encapsulates itself into the form worship. However, it doesn't mean worship in the sense that you understand, because like I said, the term latrio is only ever used for God. And you can check that out. There's a New Testament scholar who's now deceased. His name is James D.G. Dunn. He makes reference to this term in his book called Did the First Christians Worship Jesus? And although he dies as a Trinitarian believing Christian, in his, in his works he concludes no, that they didn't believe that he was, uh, that, that they worshipped him. Rather, they offered him some form of um, homage, which is later transferred. For example, when in the House of Lords in this country, they said, Your worship. It doesn't mean he's like he's literally God, it's just a form of honour and reverence. To a person of a higher disposition. Found so you found, okay, where, where have we got? So it's in Luke 19. Yes. Uh, from 35, I read, it says, they brought it to Jesus through their clothes. So they brought so the. Can I, can I read along with you? Yeah. Yeah, so, oh, yes, so I can sorry. see. So, yeah. They brought it to Jesus through their cloaks on through their cloaks on the clots, which is like a donkey, yeah. and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near to the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. They said, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, and he said, I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, well, I'll just continue this bit. Yeah. 
if you even if you if you even you had only known on this day what would bring bring you peace but now it is hidden from your eyes the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you uh, and hem you on every side they will dash you to the ground you and your children within your walls and will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you so what so what's coming to you yeah but that's not yeah but that so if we read right from the beginning if we just check can you go to the beginning of where you started to read from okay. See, look, okay. look, what, look, look what happens here. Yeah. And when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God. So they weren't praising him, they were praising God um, for the miracles they had seen. Yeah. So it's similar um, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 3 and 4, when, when Jesus forgives the sins of the paralytic man, and the, the, the Jews say, oh, Jesus must think he is God. But he says, why do you think such evil things? then about because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you so he must be saying that but God must be but he's not referring to himself yeah but yeah. he must be use, using him as a vessel yes yeah. but he's not the destination so if we read that verse right at the bottom let's just read it in context they will clash with you to the ground you and the children within your walls they will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you so that's what that's basically trying to say is that God, as you made mention, will come in that figurative sense to you to bring you back into worshipping God correctly because you people have essentially transgressed in, in all your manners. And now why I wanted you to compare that with Matthew chapter 9, a very similar event happens, right? And what happened? You probably know the Bible well, so you can recollect it, in which Christ forgives the sins of a paralytic man and he heals him. The Jews say to him, sorry, the Jews say upon to themselves, Jesus must think he is God. To that thought, he says, why do you think such evil things? To the thought that you're thinking that I'm thinking I'm God is an evil thought. And towards the end of the passage, they then give praise to God who has given authority to man to perform these acts. So even in this context and even in the one you showed me. Okay, let's go, so you said Matthew 9. Yeah, Matthew 9. Yeah. Chap I, I can bring that Matthew chapter 9, verse 3 and 4. We can go to the contemporary English version. Okay, yeah. um, Check this out. If you're gonna, this is... But he says, take heart, son, your, sin, your sins are forgiven. To so yeah. which the Pharisees had a problem with that because they said, you know, how can a human being forgive? Yeah. And then he... Uh, Jesus that's that's said, an authority being given to him, you see. Yeah. Jesus yeah. so said, uh, why do you entertain evil thoughts in your heart? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or to say, get up and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Yeah, so he's been given the authority. It was not something of his own volition. So here I'm reading from the CEV. This is really, this is really interesting. This will make you think deeply. See where I'm coming from and see if it makes sense. I believe it makes logical sense. So here we have it. Jesus got into a boat and crossed back over to the town where he lived. Some people soon brought to him a man lying on a mat because he could not walk. When Jesus saw how much faith they had, he said to the man, my friend, don't worry, your sins are forgiven. Not that he forgives sins of his own volition, but rather something is an authority that's been given to him. So it's not like he's saying, I, Jesus, forgive your sins. Rather, your sins have been forgiven. Now, for more interest to you, God has, in, to has given him the authority. But then that's through his spirit. Yeah, Wouldn't but, that be through the Lord's spirit? No, it's simply him? a directive that God has given him a authority to forgive sins. It doesn't need a spirit. It's a simple directive that you've been given the uh, go-ahead to, you know, for, to, um, why weren't we given that go ahead? Why because he's Jesus? a select chosen individual, that's why. Yeah, but this chosen individual would be the marking of the Spirit upon him, the Spirit of God. But that doesn't, doesn't have to necessitate it. He simply does the act of God as bestowed to him. Or, like he says, I, for um, wh wherever I hear, so I judge. So it's what has been gi given to him in form of revelation as a God's directive to him. Now, the crux of the matter, which is what I want you to really deeply reflect here seriously reflect on this so it says some you know so when he does this act of saying your sins are forgiven then look at this some teachers of the law of moses said to themselves jesus must think he is god look at the response to this listen carefully to the response but jesus knew what was in their minds and he said why are you thinking such evil things meaning you thinking 
that I'm claiming to be God because I've forgiven sins. It's an evil act. It's an evil thought rather. So that means, look at that. that which for you to think that I'm God, because I've forgiven sins, that's an evil thought. Now to continue further, listen to this. Let's just go to the bottom here. In verse 9. So you know when the crowd saw him doing all these acts, look what happens. So when the crowd saw this, they were afraid. And praise God for giving such authority to people. So what they've observed is a miracle has happened. He's forgiven the sins. They what become. Is that? Sorry. Yeah, that's in verse eight. Verse eight of um, chapter. Chapter nine. Chapter Matthew nine. chapter nine. So what we see, what we see here. So when the crowd saw this, and they were afraid, and they praised God. So they're giving praise to God that you've given the authority to such man, to such a man or such a person, to forgive the sins and to do that act. So even at that point where Christ has done this act yet they're very quick to thank God for it because he's given the authority to man to do as such. See that? This is exactly what I'm trying to say to you. Does that make sense? It makes sense. I'm, I'm just trying to... It, yeah. Yeah. So basically speaking, we've got about three events have happened in this single little chapter, chapter 9 um, verses... Uh, so, so what is that saying that they um, said they didn't believe it was God or that he said when he was saying they were th thinking evil thoughts? Yeah, yeah. Verse three. Verse 3, some teachers of the law of Moses said to themselves, Stop Jesus must think he is God, because obviously blasphemy would mean yeah. claiming to be God, because but only God why, can forgive sins. Why, why wouldn't Jesus... So when he said to them... Why do you Stop think such this. evil Stop. thoughts? Stop. Yeah, yeah, because they, they're saying you're blasphemy. Because, you're, because only, because you're claiming, because on the, over here it said, because you're claiming to be God, because you must think you're God, because only God can forgive sins. And, and so to that response to them then saying that I he mean, must some, some, I mean I sometimes cross version I have to read you know because but and it, I know that this is sometimes the Muslims do quick pick holes in this it's not a hole you know what it's, it's a blatant you know what it is it's not a hole it's blatantly speaking to you it's telling you Christ but listen okay just say we've got some crafty little people in the corner they're, they're enemies of Jesus yeah. right now, Christ, a man comes to him on a mat. They said, a man comes to him on a mat. Christ says, your sins are forgiven. They're watching. They're already after, they're already after Christ's guts. John chapter 8, verse 40. That he's a man who's been sent by God, yet they are determined to kill him. So they're watching on. Okay. They're, speak, they're thinking to themselves. Jesus must think he is God. Now, he has got the power to read their mind. And then he says to that thought, why do you think such evil things? So he's saying to them, that thought you are having, that I'm claiming to be God because I've forgiven sins, that's the evil but what, thought. But, but why are they sinning by denying that he's God? Because there is many places in the, the scripture where they do deny that, you know, and he could be rebuking from them for that. So but, I guess it but he never that. claims to be God. That's the whole issue in the, in the whole of the Bible. He never makes that claim. What they try to He's do, though, the son of God, though, isn't it? and listen, this is another thing. This is what I find absolutely mind-blowingly. I I would I don't want to use a harsh term, but I find it mind-blowing. What does a children of God? Though? Let me explain this to you. You know, you obviously you've had interaction with Muslims, but I want you to consider this very deeply and try to understand what I'm saying to you. The term "son of God," but you've just said, but oh, he's son of God. It literally only means one who represents God. It's defined in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. It says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. In Luke chapter 3, verse 38, Adam is referred to as son of God. In John chapter 10, verse 34, Christ refers to those who do God's work as you are gods, meaning sons of God who do God's work. So in the term son of God literally means one who represents God. It carries no divine title. Now of more significance to you to see where we're coming from, are we just nitpicking? Are we just making issues for no reason? No, because let's check this out and look at the subtle distinguishing factors here. The term son of God versus the term God the son. Stop for a moment and pause and reflect what I've said. It's a subtle distinction. Yes, boys, can you just... So it's... Yeah. So, so in effect, what, what we're, yeah, so, so, so in effect, what, what we're observing, 
is the term God the Son is not used for Christ in the New Testament. The second person of the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The term God the Son is not used for Christ or for that matter anyone else. That would have given you credence in your belief of three persons in one being, the Trinity. But what I said to you, notice the distinguishing factor without having to repeat it. The term. Yeah, no, but you've, that's your belief. Your belief is three persons in one being. There are three distinct persons well, in like, one being. It's like, it's like our body, right? So we have this shell until we die, don't we? But yeah. we have our spirit. Yes. But we also have our mind. It's all, it's all me. Yes. D you know, it's all me. I know you're a bit. There's a scripture I'm trying to look for. No, I, no I you go for it. You, you look for it. No, no, it's just fine. Now, what I've tried to show to you from there, you know the reason why I've given you that analogy? Is because when you when Christians commonly say, okay, one minute they're saying he's God, the next moment he's son of God, and when you try to, dis to explain to them, the term son of God literally means one who represents God. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, found in the Nagmaghi Desert in Egypt, did you know the, the, the term son of God, Messiah, prophet, these are all interchangeable terms, it means you can use it in the place of the other. Are you following me? Yeah, because it's under that it's under that jurisdiction of one who is a son, known as a son of God meaning those who do God's work so even angels could be referred to as sons of God even yeah go for it yeah so this is in John 1 1 yeah that's with, that which was from the beginning which we have heard because remember Jesus was always he always was it was from the very beginning with, with God which version are you reading from may I ask? Uh, NIV NIV I don't the NIV is, 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 doesn't have it like that usually it's in the beginning was the word is that John 1 1 you're reading from? yeah yeah so it should start in the beginning was the word the word was with God and the word was God which version can I just check what version that is from the top John 1 or NIV okay that's strange I've, anyway that's fine so my understanding of John 1, 1, it's not referring to Jesus. Second thing, it's a, um, it's something referred to as a parenthesis, meaning it wasn't found in the original Greek manuscripts. This is something that the author of John has put in, putting, put him, put inside himself, thinking this is what, and I'll prove this to you. Just check me, just check this out. I'll explain everything to you. So basically speaking, John 1, 1, number one, these are not Christ's words. They are the words of one of the authors of John's Gospel who has been influenced by a chap called Philo of Alexandria. Philo of Alexandria was a guy who lived about 70 years before Jesus who was a Jew, Hellenistic Jew. Hellenistic Jew is referred to as an individual or individuals rather who lived in the Greek diaspora. They didn't live in Palestine. They were Hellenistic Jews who lived within the Greek or Roman world and they watered down traditional Judaism. So what they believed was like in, in Exodus 7.1 Moses is referred to as God to Pharaoh. So the right, the file of Alexandria who, was the, who influenced John 1.1's authorship they, he himself had the idea that Christ can be also the second God like similar to what Moses was referred to in Exodus. I know that's a bit of a, that is just a bit of, it's a bit that's a bit of a tangent. No. Okay. Secondly, as I said, these are not Christ's words. Thirdly, they are referred to as a parenthesis. Parenthesis is an addition into the text, which is just the thought of that individual. Fourthly, I'm going I'm to raise so many more points. Fourthly, it says, in the beginning was the word. Right? And as far as you're that's concerned... John, that's, um, that's, the, that's the book of John, not John 1. 1. So let, let me just finish reading here. Yeah. So is that John 1 1 you've gone on? Yeah, no. but there's another one where it's John, just yeah. John, the gospel. The of letter. John. Yes. So now you've got up the letter there, have you? You've got yeah, one yeah, John. One of the, That's yeah. right. So you've got the first epistle of John up there. Epistle. That's what I was thinking. Why is it different right. for? So it says here that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it. We proclaim to you uh, the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that we may also 
have fellowship with so, sorry so that you may also have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the father and with his son jesus christ we write this to you to make our joy complete now i i just want to say i don't know if you've been hearing this but there have been a lot of muslims that have been receiving visions of, of Isa, you must have come across some of these you know, testimony yeah, videos. Yeah. Of, of, and he says, My name is Isa, is it Isa or Isa? Isa. And uh, he will say, I'm the truth of God. And instantly they know his Lord, instantly, uh, higher. You know? So I don't know the words that, for it, but yeah. I just. See, so you now what you're saying, you're making for reference to like some sort of subjective experience. But what I want to interestingly note, at right the bottom of this passage, it concludes contrary to what you may understand. Look what it says. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. Now, what is it saying there? It's distinguishing between who God is, who is the Father, and His Son, Jesus. Now, I've already explained to you what the term Son means. It literally means one who represents God. It is not in reference to some sort of divine being who is referred to as Son of God. Because we've got to understand something. You know, in the time Jesus lived, in the, amongst the Greeks, the term Son of God was taken literally. However, the term, for the Jews, the term Son of God was a metaphorical understanding of one who represents God. You understand? So in that context, individuals who represent... Individuals... Yeah. So individuals... So individuals who represent God are referred to that title as a Son of God. Are you following what I'm saying to you? So it's a, it's a title, ubiquitous, meaning widespread, for those who represent God. They are given this title, Son of God. So even that verse there, you've noticed that God is referred to as the Father and His Son, Jesus, which you would then automatically read it saying, oh, that's like his, you know, like a biological son. But no, it's trying to show to Him as His chosen elect representative, based upon the definitive explanations that I've given to you. Right. Yeah. So then what? Sorry to say, then what's the, not what's the point, but what, what I'm trying to say is that if you probably should go... No, 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 I don't need to, no, no, I'm, I'm keen to listen to you, no, so, I'm enjoying this conversation. Yes, I, I understand that he's talking about, you know, uh, his son and... So, what's the issue then of us, you know, that we are children of God as well, and that when we do accept God, that he does place his spirit in us for us to live right and proper on earth. What? So, I don't understand, so don't understand, don't understand your so question. What What's the specific question? It seems that um, well, the Muslims I've come across seem to have an issue with we are children of God, we are sons of God, you know, that kind yes. of thing. But yeah. from what you just explained, yes. God has made sons and daughters. When you receive him, he's made sons and daughters. So he what, sent his representative. So, he sent his son. so what we say in regards to that, there's a Greek word there called huyos. Huyos means servant of God stroke son of God how it worked was like this if you had a if you had a house in which there was you were the master of the house and you had a servant who was a child obviously the child is not your biological son but you, re, you refer to him endearingly as son even though he's not your son his official position is one of servant so servant son was later equivocated into the text and hence made as such. Are you following what I'm saying to you? So actually it means servant, one who represents God, or is a one who is a representative of his master. Hence he's given that title. It's based upon the Greek word called huyos. H-U-I-O-U-S. So you don't deny that Jesus is, is God's son because it does say in this word that those that don't believe are, you know, Yeah, but again, we're just making sure that you get the definition correct. The term literally means one who represents God, and it was given in the context originally that the Greek word was huyos, which meant servant stroke son. And why is it mentioned as son? Because as I've explained to you very nicely, that when a child comes to work in the house of his master, because in those days, child, you know, children were working from a very young age. So when the child would come to, so the master of the house would endearingly refer to the child as son, even though his official title was servant. Are you following what I'm saying to you? So in effect, what it shows to you is that when this reference is made, it's in reference to ones who are representatives of God. It's not a literal taking, partaking of, of, of the understanding. Have you understood okay, what I've said to you? We, 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 we disagree to that. 
No, we shouldn't disagree. This is the issue here. I want you to be very clear. You know, there's a but saying. I want you to be very yeah, clear. there's a saying from you know you must have heard of the mu musician Bob Marley. He once said, "You can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all of the people all of the time." So what he was trying to, what I'm, why have I made that comment? Is it's very important for you as well to understand? I've explained to you, and I've given you examples that others are referred to as sons of God as well, just so that you you're certain as to what I've said. It's those who represent God. So when it says in that conclusion to that passage that they may know God uh, as uh, God the Father and His Son Jesus, it's said in the context of Jesus is His representative. So the term son in that sense is one who represents. And I've defined that to you in Matthew chapter 5 verse 9. In that case, you would, if you were to be consistent and you were to say son of God means no, it's literal. Well, in that case, then you would have to say Adam is a literal son of God. Jacob is a literal son of God. If All Allah these Islam individuals are the literal sons of God. So what we're basically, so, but see, well, it's, it's a tragedy. I feel it's a crying tragedy that people can't even define these terms. Not that I'm saying you can't. I'm saying people can't define that terms. Mainly that gentleman who's walked by He's regularly over there on the pulpit. Same thing, we try to reason with them. I've explained to you, I think, very nicely. See, you've read that passage in order to give me some um, food of, to, uh, to think in terms of, well, Jesus, Jesus is referred to as the Son of God. But we've already explained now what that means. So God, but even then in that passage, right at the end, it says God is the Father and Jesus is His Son, meaning distinguishes Him as one who represents Him. How that makes sense? I, no, it does, it does. And I, I, let me just also as well just read this. No, go take your time. I hope you had a good conversation with me. I, I, I loved it. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. You'd be very pleasant. And uh, but all I'm trying to do is just it's just a matter of. No, you know what? The Lord, the, the Lord loves you. He does. Um, Are you going to show me a verse? I was looking forward to you showing me a verse. That's what I'm excited about. I believe firmly. If you read the context of every verse yeah. that you want to bring up to prove Christ in an elevated position that is which is your pre preconceived idea of your divin of him being divine the context will in itself push that notion aside all you got to do is read the context and then you got to understand who Christ is and what is he making real and why you are singularly with due respect perhaps misunderstanding what is being appropriated to you so which verse do you have to, to see Okay, so this is um, in, uh, I'll read from 18, but yeah. really it's 20 that I'm trying to get to. Okay, this but which is, verse, which chapter, which verse? Uh, this is oh, 1 John, yep. uh, so the epistle. The, the yeah. epistle of John, yeah. yep. 2, 18. Okay. okay. This is, dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard, uh, the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come. This is how we know we're in the last, that it's the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not belong to us. For if they belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But you have the anointing from the Holy One, and all, uh, sorry, and all of you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus Christ Sorry, whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Yeah. So, such a person is an antichrist, denying yes. the Father and the Son. Yes. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Okay, so that's in 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 and onwards. So check this out. This is a lovely verse. Yeah, this is really good. <coughs> you know, let me tell you something. This is a commonly, you know, not, I'm, I'm not saying yourself. Commonly, I will hear Christian missionaries saying that Islam is the Antichrist, right? Because it denies. But if you check something out, you've just read there, 1 John chapter 4. Another one you can read, 1 John chapter 2 verse 22. In both instances, in this instance here, it says the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ is of the Antichrist. However, Islam affirms that he's the Christ. Number one. 
Islam affirms, meaning uh, absolutely confirms that he is the Messiah, the Christ, the Christos. So Islam affirms. So that would re repel that notion. So the, I mean, I've commonly come through these verses. So I'm fully prepared with it. Even before you put, I thought I'd just let you uh, respect you. But what I, what, I, what I try to show to you from that verse. The definition of an antichrist is one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Note something very interesting. It doesn't say the, the antichrist is the one who denies that Jesus is God. Rather, the antichrist is the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. But Islam affirms, meaning the Messiah, the anointed one. He came to save his selected people because they had transgressed. So there you have it. That is a very Are you nice so verse. Selected people? Yes, chosen people to whom he came. Because Christ says in the Gospels. So that, do you think when he comes back, you will be going with him? Like, that you'll be so saved? our belief. Because the, the thing is, is that if if you believe this, if you even believe like in the the virgin birth as well, why is it that? I don't know. It seems like in the Muslim faith that Muhammad is upper than than, than Jesus. What, Let me explain this. This is a common misnotion. Let me explain to you graphically and vividly. Now, all the pro prophets came with a central task, essentially, from within their communities, either to redeem them, to bring them back to worshiping God, and to abstain from the transgressions that they were perpetrating. Okay. So you look at, for example, Moses. He come to redeem the Jews, to get them out of the bondage of Pharaoh. You look at Christ, who was sent for the lost sheep of the house of Israel exclusively. It only, only to them. He didn't come for the Gentiles. Then, and because they had transgressed, there were all types of ill activities taken out outside the religious institutions, like the Temple of Solomon and so forth. Gambling, prostitution, all types of skullduggery. And then the Prophet Muhammad, upon whom be peace, who came to a pagan Arab community, who were idol worshippers, buried their daughters alive. If a girl was born, they'd bury the girl in the sand. Such was the disgrace of having a daughter. So he came in amongst those community to bring them back to worship in one God and one God alone. And he sacrificed everything for this purpose. Now, Did he acknowledge Jesus? Yes, of course. I'm going to answer you and I'm going to answer in such a way that you will be very, very satisfied. So, in terms of your question, so what we say is all the prophets were equal in their disposition. They were all honored and loved and given a high category by God. The Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace, however, was a universal messenger for all of mankind. The Quran states, Illa rahmatan lil alameen. We have only sent you, O Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace, as a messenger, as, sorry, as a mercy to all of mankind. So whereas the other prophets, like Jesus in particular, came only for a select people, he came for as a mercy to all mankind, hence he has to be followed. But we don't, we don't go around the streets drum, playing the drums and saying, Muhammad is the greatest of all time and he's far superior to Jesus. Jesus in front of him is like a, a, you know, a, a lowly person. No, 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 we don't say that. Pardon? But there's a contrast because if Jesus is saying, follow me. Yes. And then you're following Muhammad. So what we say to that, so when you reference John 14, 6, so when Christ says, follow me, it's to those people at that time. They could notice who he's trying to address. He's addressing Thomas in that particular chapter. So what he's trying to say to them in effect, that is by, because God has chosen him, he is the way to go at that time during that period. Because obviously the prophets, only it was only Jesus sent for that specific task at that time of history. Are you following me? I am following yeah, you. for that. Yeah, so hence it makes sense. Yeah, I would love to for you to share me other stuff as well. So hopefully that verse which you showed to me in 1 John chapter 4, all it's shown to us is that the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ is of the Antichrist. But Islam affirms, so that doesn't apply to Islam. But more of more significance for you, I'm finding it very, very telling. It doesn't say the Antichrist is the one who denies that Jesus is God. Okay. So I'm just going to take it from when Jesus um, is, he died, but he rose again, and it's appeared which, to his which disciples. Said, it's Mark 16. Mark 16. It says after Jesus appeared. Which verse? Sorry, sorry, interrupt you. Which verse? Um, I'll start from 12. Yeah, but you, you know that's referred to as a longer ending of Mark. 
because in the original manuscripts from verse 9 to 20 of chapter 16 it's not in there this was a later interpolation are you following what i'm saying to you in, yeah, I think yeah. It's this bit, yeah it's, I know, and I'm just letting you know for yeah, your information yeah, yeah. that is this the um, sorry, this NIV you got there, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I'm just letting you know for your information that for, in everyone, I mean, this is commonly known amongst like circles that um, in Mark chapter 16, the resurrection from verse 9 to 20, this is what you call the longer ending of Mark, in which these verses were not in the original Greek manuscripts, but were later interpolations, and, and you will see that um, that um, in fact. Um, yeah, is that Mark's you're reading from, isn't it? Mark, yeah. yeah. So, like I said, the NIV they will have it, but it's not in the earlier. Um, it's not in the earlier um, manuscripts. That verse nine to twenty. Verse nine to twenty. Yeah, which is about talking about the resurrection. Yeah. Well, when he says um, that they will um, cast out, he said to go and spread the, the gospel to all creation okay. and baptize them. In the, so, so go you mean, into all so, the world, yeah. preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, you will drive out demons. Yeah. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. And they will place their hands on the sick and they will get well. And after Jesus had spoken, he was taken up. So what I'm trying to point out is go into all the world. But do you know what? I have to go. Okay. <laughs> no. uh, really it's a shame. Away, I, you, so. I would have liked to have responded. That's fine. If you need to go, that's fine. It's been great speaking to you. Yeah. What I will in, in conclude, just in, in, invite you to perhaps, uh, when you read the New Testament, there's two verses which should really give you food for thought. Okay. Mark chapter 10, verse 17, and John chapter 17, verse 3. Okay. For me, the Mark 10, 17 is the verse that you really need to Go home and read tonight if you can. Mark 17. Mark chapter 10, verse 17. 10, 10, 10. Where a rich young man runs up to Jesus, say, Good teacher, what must I do to get eternal life? Jesus says, Why do you call me good? There is no one good except God alone. Well, he was in flesh at that but, time. Wasn't but, he? but he doesn't say that, does he? I mean, within, within that passage, he doesn't say, but, By the way, I was in flesh. But anyway, I don't want to keep you. Please do, um, uh, you can watch our discussion if you like. It's on YouTube. Yep, yeah, it's called okay. Sam Dawa. Sam, Sam do you, do you want to, do, your, okay. no, it's not my one, do you want to, um, you can subscribe to it and then you'll get notification. So I'm, I'm going to be on there. Like, yeah, but if you want to, you, we can blur you out if you want. We can blur your face out if you like. Some people make that, others, others, but some people don't want to be seen, you see. But you, that's excellent, yeah. So if you just subscribe, yes. We've had a number of conversations today and people have been happy to um, have their face. Yesterday someone didn't want their face, so we just blur it out. We commonly just, you know, use the pixel effect. Just to blur out the face. That's cool, yeah. I bless you, I respect you. It's been a great conversation. Um, so, if you type in Sam, is this on YouTube you've got it on? Oh, okay, sorry, I think you want me to make it. So, make it easy if you just type in Sam on, on YouTube. Sam, and then uh, D A W A H. Oh, is this your channel? It's my friend's channel there, with the, with the, with the brother with the cap. So, if you subscribe to that, yeah, subscribe, excellent, then you'll get notification when he uploads it. And it's also another channel, another brother who's, who's that, his channel. Um, it, that's called, if you type that in the bar, what? if you go to the top bar, I say just delete that. D A W A H 2. That's the top one, do the top one there. Okay, subscribe to that channel. So they, when they upload it, which hopefully will be within a few days at the uh, at the latest, I know he's pretty quick in uploading them. But you won't like cut it where it's. No, like, no, we won't cut it. No, 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 cut it at all. No, nothing. It's been a nice free-flowing conversation. So there's no need for me to. You can recollect a lot of the things that I made. So I promise you, it won't be cut. And you can, we can, um, yeah, you can watch it. And then we're here regularly anyway. Um, on Saturdays, we've got actually a table over here. Okay. Islamic information table running from 2.30 up until about 9 o'clock, particularly this time of year. Um, so if you want to come by and you want to discuss anything, you're welcome to. We'll be here Saturday, like I made mention. But once that is uploaded, you'll get notification which will come on your phone that you've subscribed. And um, we, we can watch our conversation. Yeah, yeah, I look forward to that. Okay. I want you to... Have you watched this before? 
Is it some sort of um, testimony how he comes to Christ? Yeah. You can see, you know what? The only thing I, you can get the other way around as well. Because there are testimonies where Christians have become Muslims as well. This very famous one of an English guy on YouTube as well, who had a dream of the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace, and he was referred that he became Muslim. So, this subjective. You know what? You know this. You know when, when, think about this going forward for yourself when you speak to people. It's very much subjective to that individual because I know for a fact Hindus make the same claim in terms of their um, people of their higher dispositions where they go to the river Ganges and they do say they see many wonders and miracles taking place and experience and they have their testimonies as well so that I would say is not something that you should commonly use in terms of testimonies it's okay to have it in terms of something that's in, in your back in the background but in terms of the actual you know, trying to show that this is like overwhelming evidence, it doesn't really because, like I said, for every one you show, it's another like one can be shown. Sometimes the spiritual world has to get in contact with the physical, you know. That's, I guess, very subjective, isn't it? Well, how, how am I going to see it? How am I going to see it? But try and watch it. I think it says former Hezbollah, um, wait, hold on, former Hezbollah member. I think it turns to Jesus Christ. Sorry, I've lost. That's it. fine. I think I can, I'll spot that. That's no problem. Okay, great speaking to you. All the best to you. Thanks. Take care. Take care, sir. Bye bye. So, inshallah, we had a nice conversation with this uh, missionary lady, a uh, very nice, pleasant lady. And um, as we can see, we discussed a number, number, number of options. What we have observed from this particular discussion is that whichever verses are brought up as evidence of an elevated Christ in terms of his persona as Christians understand him to be God. We can see when you apply the context of whatever passage that they seek to bring up, we can satisfactorily conclude it's to the contrary to what they understand. So inadvertently, whatever our Christian friends bring up as evidence of his divinity, whatever claim they want to make about him, when they read the context, as you probably saw me observe, making relentless themes to read the context and apply that and noticing the distinguishing factors. So when you're able to do that and evaluate that, hence you're able to understand that everything that they conclude is to the contrary. So these are some of the methods that they employ. It's very useful for them in particular as well to read the context of whatever point they're trying to make and see where we're coming from in this regard. Okay, inshallah, Allah guide us.